My name is Phil Orchard and the service I was in was Merchant Navy and I was a radio officer. Yeah, the radio operator, now our job on the ship in convoy in the Atlantic was that uh, we did not keep continuous watch at all because the submarines could hear our receivers and therefore we kept a watch on the bridge with the captain and the mates on watch. Uh, we also did the coding and decoding so we knew everything that was going on and very close to those people at the whole time. And so you may find even that we know a lot more about it than some others. And then and quite as well is the uh, secret side of it. And uh, the, the mates and the masters were more or less just learning the Morse code in those days. We were pretty good at it. And uh, so that'll give you a bit of an idea. And if an aircraft came, for instance, to call us, he'd say AAA, which means I want to talk to you. And we would say K, which means go ahead. And we'd go ahead, not at the slow m speed that the mates might try to do. We go it fast as they did too. About 20 or more words a minute, just the same as you hear the Navy. And so that's the way it is. We knew the flags, we did the lot. And then all the more and people on the bridge is handy too, more people to look around for something on the water we didn't want. And so that'll give you a bit of the idea and perhaps give you an idea of what we what we saw and the rest of it. Sometimes I've seen ships have been torpedoed, one right next to us had the same cargo as we had, everything that blew up. He did blow up, and I don't know how many lives would have been saved in that instance, and at that particular time. My father was at sea all his life. He was a chief engineer, and uh, and so uh, I suppose it was, had to follow some time. I was always interested in radio, amateur radio, and that sort of thing, and. Uh, he paid up at one stage, and uh, so I got did the, the course at the Marconi School of Wireless for 12 months, and that got me a ticket, and, and very soon we were in demand. Very soon we are away on an overseas ship, and so that's the way it goes. I was the only Australian on board, and I gave it all back too. <laughs> so that's a bit of it. There's always somebody either sneaking behind you talking or, or somebody else shouting down your neck. But the bloke was making most of the noise. It turned out he was a Scotsman. And it turned out to be my best, best friend on the ship. And uh, while we were in Manchester, the two of us were uh, worked by the ship while others went. And so we were very good friends. And he was a fellow who had been down in the ship. He was on one of those tankers that got torpedoed and he had dived into the water and come up and found he was amongst flames and oil so he dived in again to get out of it and he's still alive and so he was second mate of that sh ship there I was on and I suppose he would have become a master later on. One next door to us was stolen, carrying the same cargo as us, war supplies and the rest of it. It completely exploded. I shifted in my chair. I was on watch at the time. <coughs> and uh, whether anybody lives from it, I doubt. Uh, that's the sort of stuff we're carrying, bombs, heavy stuff. I've seen instances where one ship swapped places with in the night with another one, with the fog around, things like that. No, there's not many happens because uh, the ship has uh, an engineer down below with his hand on the tiller, not the tiller, but on the controls uh, all the time. It's very hard on them 
uh, keep continuous watch all the time there, in the same way with the mate on watch, and the speed has to be watched as well. They, uh, all the lights are closed and the rest of it, and if the escort sees a, a light coming from your ship, he's likely to fire on it. I don't blame you. <laughs> and there are some things you hear, you know. You hear a ship going down, and the morse starts to slow down. The water's coming in, and the machinery stopped. And it, it's an awful feeling. There are things like that you come across in the sea. And so there we are. And then, of course, there was the secret stuff we did. We did. Can't tell you much about it. It's still secret, so that's the way that goes. And we know what the Germans were doing with the Enigma machine. It was spent, sent at very high morse, and it was received on the other end on a symbol a simple type of receiver. So, uh, and the, uh, the Enigma machine is quite small, you may have seen one, and in the front of it is just like a typewriter. It's not heavy, and usually in a wooden box, and uh, it runs off a nine volt battery, and every station has one of these things, and they have books and papers uh, which are very regularly changed. Without those, you can't get the immediate result on your, on your signals. That's it. I've seen one and seen it being demonstrated. They were not a German invention. They were invent invented by the Poles, and just by sheer luck, the, uh, the British had one during the war, and uh, it was highly secret. There was a, a German U-boat called uh, 510, I think, and the skipper was Lemp, who was the skipper of the uh, ship, first ship that was sunk during the war. And uh, he had been depth charged and surfaced, and, uh, <clears throat> and there were, nearby there were two of those American type uh, ship, uh, naval ships nearby, and one of them was about to ram but was told not to, and uh, so the German ship stayed there on the surface, and the crew got off. Uh, a naval boat came and took the crew, took them away, put them down deep in the ship, and told them nothing. And then another crew went out and examined the submarine and the uh, Enigma machine and all the papers were there and went to Betley Park. And so from then on, uh, we had the signals the whole time. <laughs>